Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar titled Fluid Bed Processing, Drying Agglomeration, and Particle Coating. Our speaker today is Dr. Willie Hendrickson, um, the founder and CEO of Avika Group. Willie is also one of our most popular speakers here at Harifa Scientific. If you haven't listened to his webinar from 2020, you must. Avika is a spinoff of 3N, where it started with three people and just one site. And ever since, it's grown into close to 300 people. So congratulations. Um, Willie received his PhD from the University of Florida in organometallic synthesis. He's currently the president of International Fine Particle Institute, and he has also authored or co-authored more than 20 technical paper, um, books, chapters, and is an inventor of more than 50 issue or applied US patents. So, Willie, I think this is it. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the ball to you. Would you please share your screen? There, well, welcome everybody. Uh, you know, thank you for joining us today. I, I, as Julie said, I've done a few of these Hariba seminars and webinars, and I absolutely love them. Uh, and in fact, what you'll find is I, I actually love to talk. And to have all of you show up today is a, it's a, it's a real treat for me. Well, today we're going to talk about, as Julie said, we're going to talk about fluid bed processing, drying, agglomeration, and particle coating. It's a topic near and dear to my heart. And so let's let's get going and see if we can get get this uh, this party going. So the outline, I'm going to give you, a, you know, a, a, just a, a couple minute uh, overview of Avika. We're going to talk about particle processing, the big six, some dilemmas, some different methods. Uh, because we are doing fluidization, I'm going to we'll talk a little bit about Derek Gildart. And finally, I'm going to get into some examples and, uh, you know, some opportunities in the future and conclusions. And, you know, please, uh, you know, think of think of good questions. I, I need good questions to, to keep this uh, keep this interesting. So. Let's get going. Uh, as as Julie said, uh, you know we started in 1994 as a spinoff from 3M. Uh, we're we're currently five companies with 290 employees, and we are a particle technology company focused on contract manufacturing. You know we do all kinds of different materials. Uh, we the different sites that we have are specifically for you know food or industrial chemicals or grinding. Uh, just depends on on what we need and. You know, we, we were able to handle quite a bit of things. And, and you know, the, 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 uh, the, the thing that I'm going to talk about today, though, is not so much about Avika, but, you know, particle processing and what I call the big six. And these are the, if, you're, if you are a person that's handling solids, you're going to be doing probably all six of these sometimes in your career. Uh, you know, characterization, uh, flow, blending, size reduction, drying, agglomeration, particle coating. And clearly, clearly, you know, understanding how to how to use these these processes can help you with your your job, your 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 formation, your your uh, development of a product, but also you know how you can be efficient in, in production. Today, I'm re really going to focus on the bottom three: drying, agglomeration, and particle coating. And I just want to give you an ex example of some of the, the the breadth of what we're looking at here. So, at the bottom of the screen. This is an example of tray drying, and, and some of you might recognize this, but this is shrimp paste that somebody is drying uh, in the in uh, Southeast Asia. So they they make the shrimp paste, which is in one sense you can call that a particle process, and then they put it on these trays and dry it. Um, you know, it, it really quite an interesting process. Up in the upper right hand, upper left hand corner is uh, an example of agglomeration. Some of the things that we're going to talk about today. And this particular uh, particle that we're looking at is something that has been agglomerated for probably 500 years. And this is an example of gunpowder as an agglomerated powder. I think some of you know that if you don't agglomerate gunpowder, uh, you don't get a good uh, bang for your buck, so to speak. And so, uh, you know, agglomeration has always been an important process in, 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 that, in that regard. And finally, in the upper right-hand corner is a, is a great example of a coated particle. And you can see that this is a multi-layered particle, probably produced by Wooster coating, something that we're going to talk today. Uh, but this is actually an example of a uranium fuel target that, that's used in, in uh, the nuclear fuel industry. So quite a variety from food to gunpowder to, to uh, energy, uh, you know, the things that we're going to talk about. You know, when, when, what we're really talking about is how you can make what we call engineered particles. 
And you know, when when we're doing this this drying, grinding, uh, coating, uh, agglomeration, what we're trying to do is we're trying to control that size. We're trying to you know modify that functional property. We're we're looking at controlled release. And so you know, the things that that we all handle every day is that they're not just stuff. They're not just powders. But realistically. What we're talking about is engineered particles and how do we get to that and how can in this particular talk how can we use fluid bed processing to get us there so before i really talk about that i, I just want everybody to think about you know the dilemmas that they have when they're processing and you know when, when you're faced with a new project and you want to get going in it one of the things that you're faced with is what equipment do you have available so you know if a if a hammer mill is the product the process that you really need to use but you don't have a hammer mill it really doesn't help you to spend a lot of time worrying about hammer mills but if you have a jaw crusher you know maybe you have to figure out how to get that to work that available equipment we're going to talk about that a couple times through, throughout this talk the other issue the other dilemma that i face is that you know what might be really good on a lab scale you can see this distillation column that we that we set up at the top in the lab versus what's actual uh, reality in, in full-scale production, that volume scalability di dilemma. Don't get yourself into a process that you can't scale it up because it's a, it's a disaster to happen. For us people that handle powders, uh, uh, we, we can either call ourselves uh, 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 solids engineers or we can call ourselves powder heads or we can call ourselves particle technologists, one of the biggest issues that we face is this is this dilemma of my powder just doesn't flow right it sticks in the tubes it doesn't flow out of the bag it's hard to fill into a tablet making system understanding that and being prepared to deal with that in all of these processes that we're doing and and some of the, the processes that we're going to talk about today in fluid bed are incredibly important and finally, you, you've made this wonderful particle, but it doesn't function the way you want. Well, that's a dilemma, isn't it? It makes for a real hard time. So I, we've got all of these things to deal with. We've got to pick the right equipment. We've got to pick the right materials. We've got to pick the right processes. And then we have to deal with these dilemmas because we are going to be faced with them every single time. So let's talk about let's talk about some of the drying technologies that we have. And, and why would you pick one drying technology over another? And what I have an example here is this is not an inclusive uh, uh, list of all the drying technologies, but these are some of the ones that people use in powder processing all the time. I love the picture in the middle of the of the people scraping up salt from from tray drying, if that's what we want to call it. Uh, uh, this is a this is a picture from Southeast Asia. I was actually in Thailand last year when you could still travel around, and there were miles and miles and miles of these salt pans where people dried salt and it looked exactly like this. This is, a, this is one of the drying processes that have been used forever. Uh, a little bit more modern is the, the picture right above it of the, of the, uh, the tray drying oven. Uh, you know, so you know, it, we, we've gotten a little bit better of it. And you know, remember the, the shrimp drying trays that, that, we, that we had. But some of the other pictures on here are pictures of Fluid beds up in the upper right corner. That the the other two pictures on the right are pictures of spray dryers, you know, double dumb dryers down at the bottom, a turbulizer for for uh, high shear drying, and in the in the middle of the page is a large piece of equipment called a ring dryer. If you had all these pieces of equipment available to you, you 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 can you can eliminate the the process equipment dilemma. Of what you have available. But the reality is, is we usually don't have those, so we, we're going to have to pick and choose. And realistically, when you look at these dryers, some dryers are better off for drying solutions or slurries, the spray dryers, the, the, the roll dryers, and some processes are better off drying pastes and, and uh, you know, wet solids like the turbulizers, the, the ring dryers, or the fluid bed dryers. You know what you have to start with, and where you're going to, and how big equipment piece that, that you have available makes a huge difference on picking picking the dryer. For agglomeration, uh, you know, once again, we have a we have a, a fluid bed picture here. That fluid bed agglomeration is a great process for agglomeration, but there's other thing other things that can be used. High shear agglomeration using a Bella mixer, which is in the lower right corner or a, a, a turbulizer, which is up at the up at the top uh, right side. And then finally, extrusion agglomeration. And once again, 
why would you pick one process over the other? But I, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an example. If I was going to agglomerate uh, powders for laundry detergent, I probably wouldn't pick a fluid bed uh, uh, system because it's a typically, at least in this picture that I have here, it's a batch process, and it's not as efficient as high shear agglomeration, the Bella mixer. So, you know, you, you might have a, there's just a volume issue that you're gonna be pushed to one process or another, but, uh, you know, fluid beds are, are clearly used a lot for, for agglomeration. And finally, the last, the last technology that, that, that we're gonna be talking about today is once again, there's a fluid bed front and center in the system for doing particle coating. But boy, there's lots of other techniques. I, I show at the bottom left-hand corner, just a, a simple ribbon blender. And if you can use a ribbon blender or a V blender, these are inexpensive, easy to use, not necessarily good for every powder. And up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a, a process, a tablet coating that's being shown there that's probably very good for large particles where a fluid bed, for instance, might be better for smaller particles. And if you really want to get to the smallest particles, there's a, a schematic I have shown here. This is a, a system called MACE, Magnetically Assisted Impact Coating. This is a process that we do here at Avika that, that's really good for those small particles, even down to nanoparticles. So with all of these, all of these things, you know, you, you've got a project that you're going to do. You, you know what process that you're going to use, uh, or, you, or you, you know that there's a process that you're going to use. Why would I do a fluid bed? What makes the fluid bed so versatile? And, and the, the answer is on this slide. Fluid beds can do many different things. Uh, an example, if you want to dry, you don't have a spray dryer in there. If you want to agglomerate or coat, you can maybe do uh, spraying from the top of the system. If you want to do really good coating in the Wooster coating system as shown at the bottom, you can do the spray drying from the bottom. And some people have even, even changed this a little bit and actually do what's called tangential spray for coating. The, 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 the interesting thing about this, at least with the sprain, we're either agglomerating or we're coating, but the processes really are similar. And I, I've shown some of the kind of the mechanistic steps that occur in agglomeration in the middle where you're putting some water in, you form some liquid bridges, you dry these bridges to form solid bridges. And finally, if you can get to that blackberry structure, that's a great agglomerated particle because it has that porosity that allows water to wick in, in quickly for it. However, you're using exactly the same piece of equipment and sometimes even the same spray dynamics, and you can also get particle coating. And one of the challenges that we have with spray drying is going from, if I want agglomeration, I really don't want to have single particle coating. And if I want single particle coating, I really don't want it to be agglomerated. And controlling those process parameters and understanding how to do that is really one of the tough, tough things uh, to, to figure out when you're doing a process development for uh, uh, using a fluid bed. But because it is a fluid bed, we do need to we do need to take a step back and talk just a little bit about particles and which particles are useful in a fluid bed and which aren't. In 1973, a man named Derek Gildart really, really did, you know, really brought a lot of science together and simplified it into this chart that, that, he, that he had, this uh, chart that has four different groupings of powders. Group A powders, and, and basically what we're looking at, we're, we're comparing particles to size on the x-axis and density on the, on the y-axis. And what happens is, is when you're in that in, in a specific region, these particles operate very specifically in, in a sense of fluidization. So group A particles, this is the particles that we want. These are, are aeratable, these are fluidizable particles. And typically, if you have to kind of give a, a statement, you want your, your, your type A particles, your group, group A particles to be within that 50 to maybe a couple hundred microns. That's a great range to do fluid bed coating. If the particles get bigger or they get a little denser, they become sand-like. And you can still fluidize those particles, but the energy that you have to take for those particles starts to get greater than the energy that you can get out of the, the fluid air that's coming through. And so, you know, boy, that, that's a you can do type B particles in a fluid bed, but typically that you, you start to get into a, a nebulous region. 
Type D particles, group D particles are spawnable. These are big particles. You can push air through them, but you're really tough to, to fluidize them. But the ones that, that give us the biggest challenge are type C particles, these cohesive particles. So they're smaller, they're lighter, typically lighter in weight, and they have a tendency to stick together. Those are a challenge because many times those are the particles that you want. So, you know, as, if we, as we've gone through this issue about, you know, do we have the equipment? Do we have the right, the, do we have the right size equipment? Do we have the, the, the drying, the coating, the, the whatever? We now get into this spot that we might have everything that we need, but the particle is in a wrong region. And, and we'll talk about some of these as, as we go through about why we would pick one or the other. But once again, remember that the particles that we like, you know, the just right particles are that group A particles at uh, 50 to 200 microns. So ultimately why we're doing this is we're looking for functionality. Uh, you look at the pictures on the on the left side and the, the, the picture up in the upper left corner, this is the disaster picture of all times. You know, from a from a particle stand processing standpoint, this is the dirtiest picture in many ways that I can possibly show you. And the reason that this is so bad is look at the dust and these people being exposed to this dust and actually doing this. They're actually screening particles and in the process of screening them, this incredible amount of dust comes out. Dust free particles is one of the big reasons that people use fluid beds to, to agglomerate and control that dust. Another example shown on this, on this slide is wettability. I think we've all seen the, the case where we've taken a powder that we're gonna dissolve into water and we put it in there and it lays on the surface like this. This isn't a disaster for something that you wanna get it into water and dispersed and solubilized quickly. This is called uh, you know, the, the wettability and we, we will actually talk about some of these cases. But other things such as powder flow, water activity, controlled release, surface modification, this is why we wanna use fluid beds. So, blah, 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 blah. You know, let's actually get to the, to the examples and just see what the heck that we have here and why we want to do this. So, as I said earlier on, I'm going to talk about drying. I'm going to talk about agglomeration. I'm going to talk about particle coating. And I've got lots of examples, some of them really good examples, and some of them where we failed, which is probably really good examples also. I'm going to give you the statement of the, of the need, how we approach the problem, why we chose fluid bed processing and what was really the outcome and was there a way to, to make it better at, at the end? So let, let's get started with this and let's start with the easiest thing that we can do. Let's start out with drying materials that are temperature insensitive uh, and can, can be dried in a number of ways. And so typically what we're doing is we're either just trying to reduce the moisture of a flowable dry powder, in the case of the dry powder, uh, the, the biofire, fiber, we just wanted to get it from 10% down to, down to, you know, about 3%. Drying a walnut shells, you know, this is, this was a wet cake that, that we received and we need to take, you know, go from 40 to 60% moisture to 2% and we need to do it fast. Now, in all cases, in this type of, this type of system, you're really not trying to change the particle size. We're not expecting agglomeration. We're not expecting, uh, you know, size reduction. Uh, and I, what I have over here is a, is a picture of the biofiber, which is actually bigger than what we typically would want to use, but the density was low enough that we could actually fluidize this particle. And so fluid beds made a lot of sense. Uh, down at the bottom, I just show a particle size distribution of, of this biofiber, and you can see it's bigger than what you want. And I, I could have shown you before and after uh, PSD, but it would have looked exactly the same. The interesting, the interesting thing, the reason that we picked this biofiber is that this was a very short run. We didn't need to go to a continuous process uh, and it just, fluid bed just made sense. I could have probably done this in, in other ways, but in this particular case, you know, the, the uh, fluid bed made sense. For the walnut shells, we literally do hundreds of tons of this a month that we dry walnut shells. And the reason that we actually do fluid bed processing with walnut shells isn't because the volume is optimal for fluid beds, it's probably not, but this is an example of this was the piece of equipment that we had. So the processing dilemma of available equipment put us in there and we ended up with one of the interesting scenarios and I think you've all seen this, 
is when you pick a process and qualify a process, it's almost impossible to change it afterwards. And that's exactly what happened here. Let's look at that. Let's look at uh, you know what went wrong. Nothing. You know, fluid bed drying is incredibly useful for varieties of materials, and you know the reality is is use them for wet cakes all along. There might be other things to use it for, but you know in this particular case we we, we use it a lot for this. Let's take a look at drying fluid beds that have the more sensitive. So we I got two examples of here. I want to dry some encapsulated beads. They're incredibly sens uh, temperature sensitive and very fragile. These are actually core shell beads, and you can see them on the upper right hand corner, the blue beads up at the top. That's a very thin shell of gelatin with an oil on the inside. If we pound on these beads too hard, they'll break. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. But you know, when we're trying to dry them, we don't want to have that happen. The other thing that 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 we found out is we decided because these are relatively big beads, like, you know, a millimeter in size. We decided to look at three ways of drying, tray drying, uh, fluid bed drying, and tumble drying. And what we found out, if you look at the picture down at the bottom, you see the, the uh, picture on the left, the oblong sphere. If we tray dried it, the particles ended up oblong. You know, they were soft enough when they went into the trays that they were deformed a little bit. You know, kind of think of a, a, a weak uh, sack of material. Uh, if we tumbled them, tumble coated them, or fluid bed dried them, it, I, I meant coat, uh, drying, not coating, you'd actually get a very spherical bead. And as it turned out, that functionality was incredibly important for this for this particular process. So even though tray drying worked, and it might have been a cheap process to do, it didn't give the functionality of that sphericity. The, the, the second one I have on here is drying live micro matrices. And I don't know if you've seen this, but as the world has changed, we've gone more and more to bioprocessing. And one of the things that people are always looking to do is to have a stabilized dry microbe powder. Now, microbes in general don't like being dried. And so there's lots of matrices that you have to put around this in order to stabilize that microbe and not kill it. But one of the things about the microbes that we're dealing with, and, and just think of uh, uh, microbes for, for eating, uh, bioactive microbes in your, in your gut. You, you know, those things are so sensitive if you pour them, uh, if you stir them, if you look at them crosswise, they die. And what happens when you pour them, stir them, and dry them, they really die. And so people are typically happy in, in putting a dry, getting a dry microbe that might have one to two percent yield of live microbes of all that all that you had. We have found that we can dry microbes and get 90 percent viability after drying by having the right matrix and that gentle process at a low temperature. We can actually get there. Not easy, but you know it can be it can be done. So what went wrong? Nothing, boy. These are these are great processes. Fluid bed is a great process to use for temperature sensitive materials, for shear sensitive materials. And, and in this particular, this one particular case with the beads, we actually had shape preservation. The reality is we use this process at Avika instead of spray drying because we, or excuse me, freeze drying, because we don't have a freeze dryer. It's that process dilemma again. What equipment do you have? Uh, so we've actually enabled, instead of doing a freeze drying to make uh, fluid bed drying work quite nicely for us. So let's look at let's let's change from drying to agglomeration. Uh, you know, agglomeration, it's a it's a it's a great process. Uh, and the statement of challenges here is we had a customer come to us and ask us to agglomerate dairy powders to improve dispersibility, this capillary absorption. So you know, once again, we look down at the bottom of the of the picture here or the slide, and we see that rat that blackberry structure that we're really trying to get. That's what that's what we're trying to do. So. This was a this was a project done a long time ago. This was a a quick project, uh, and and we we don't have particle size distribution or particle uh, uh, pictures of this, but we do have what happened with the dispersion. So this dairy powder that is water dispersible, water soluble, you know, you'd put it into you know put it into a glass with a spoon, as shown up here in the upper right hand corner, and boy, it would sit there for 90 seconds or two minutes or three minutes, and it just wouldn't dissolve. And some of us you know, know that with materials like this, sometimes you can actually form gels where you get a, 
a liquid absorption on the outside and you get dry powder on the inside, it's exactly what you don't want to have. When we, when we just try to agglomerate this using just a real quick and dirty, let's add water fast to the system, it wasn't any better. So, you know, obviously functionality is important here. And the question really was, is were we actually getting that BlackBerry structure or were we just making a coating or, or even a, a condensing of, a, of the particle? If we added water slowly, we now started to see dispersion. And if we added water slowly and backed off the amount of water, we actually got something that was 17 seconds dispersible. Those of you that know about uh, you know agglomeration to get dispersible powders, also called instantizing, know that that 17 seconds is is forever. This is not an optimized uh, uh, system here, but it's just something that shows you can modify your conditions and you can get to a, a dispersible system that works quite nicely. What went wrong? Nothing. I mean, the, the process really worked well. Agglomeration is consistently used to produce better dissolution or instantized products. The reality for us in this in this case is we actually proved to the customer that this was this was this worked, and the customer actually took this process in house and is is producing product right now to this day with this. I think they probably optimized it to get that higher dissolution. However. Let's look at uh, agglomeration to improve the material flow and decrease dustiness. Now, remember material flow is one of my process dilemmas, one of the hardest things that we can possibly know. In this particular, it, know how to understand it and control it. In this particular case, what we're looking at is a spray dried material. And you can see at the bottom an SEM picture of this spray dried material. And I just want to point out the, these raw material and agglomerated materials, they are not at the same magnification. I apologize for that. The, the particles on the left side you know, are 15 to 20 microns in, in size, and the particles on the, on the right size are that 200 to 300 microns in size. So you know, just, just play with me on, on this. The raw material from a particle size distribution, the spray dried material was really a standard spray, uh, spray dried particle size distribution. Oh, geez, I have D10 up at the top. I'm sorry, it's supposed to be D10, D50, D90. I, I missed that. I apologize for that. The, the D50 on these materials is about 50 microns. It's boy, a real standard spray dried material. And when we agglomerate that with water or with water and binder, you know, we get up to 200 microns. This is a perfect agglomeration uh, scenario on here. The interesting part about this was, is let's go to the functionality on this. For our customer, they actually needed to compare this product to a flake product. You know, think of uh, Tetramin fish food that has that flaky structure. That was the, the, the type of material that they were used to getting. And they had their powder flow meter set up to handle this material and get exactly the flow that they needed. It worked really, really nice. We agglomerated our material. We got close to the particle size that, that they had from their, their drum drying process. And in our eyes, this powder flowed better than the, than the powder that, that uh, the, the, the flake. Sent it off to the customer, put it through their feeders, and they sent back and says, you made it worse than, than better. And here's one of the, the challenges of incredible challenges in particle processing is powder flow. So let's see if we can actually come up with a measurement technique that works. I have a, I have a graph here poorly, poorly uh, defined, but the bottom curve is what the aeration energy it takes to aerate the spray dried material. And the top curve is the aeration energy it takes to aerate the preferred product. Now, if it aerates better, one always thinks that it flows better. And look at we have more energy on the one that, that flows better than the one that doesn't. Hmm. If we actually look at the agglomerated powders are shown here, the, the bottom line is still the, the spray dried material and the top line is this flake material. We actually uh, change the flowability by agglomeration, but it doesn't really tell us 
you know, are we are we better or worse on this thing? And in fact, it looks like the larger particles are harder to aerate than the than the spray dried material. Now, that's not quite true, but you know, this this is the interpretation. So, you know, maybe aeration isn't the way that we want to want to look at this. Maybe we want to look at permeability. How how can uh, air go through the system? So we're looking at a pressure drop versus airflow in the system. The bottom line that you see on this on this slide, that's the flake material, what people like. And the top line where it takes more energy, more pressure drop to get to get air through the system is our, our spray dried material. So, you know, what happens when we agglomerate that and we're looking at permeability once again? You, you see that the top line is still the raw material. And the bottom lines are all the agglomeration processes that uh, parameters that we used, and I, we couldn't tell any difference. And it looked exactly the same as the, uh, the the standard, but the functionality to the customer wasn't right. I, you know, the the embarrassing part about this is is I can see that it flows better. I can't measure it to tell why it flows better or how it flows better. One of those, the, the real problems of, of just about anything, I, you know, fluid bed processing, we know it works better, but it didn't work better for the customer, and I can't measure it, even though we tried lots of other measurement techniques. And I'd like to say that we're not alone in this problem. I mean, this is a, a, a standard problem. So what went wrong? Nothing. I mean, it, it, it was really the material was less dusty, which I didn't talk about. It flowed better than the spray dried material, but not to the satisfaction of our customer. They didn't like it. We, 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 we still think that there's process improvements and we're, we're still looking at this process for production, but who knows where this one's gonna go. Even though I, I think we were wildly successful, uh, you know, if the customer doesn't think so, I guess that probably means we weren't successful. So last set of examples. I think I have two, two examples here. I think I have two examples. Um, we're going to, we're going to do, no, I think I have three examples. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to do some coding, uh, using fluid beds. So, you know, this is, this is the one that everybody wants to do. You know, this is great. Just imagine that I have any particle that you want and I can put that uniform coating around the outside. That's your imagination. Now let's look at reality here. So uh, the statement of the challenge in this one is we have a ground up seed that somebody wants to, uh, use as a flavor to delivery vehicle, I want to coat a flavor on the outside of this. We don't want very much agglomeration and we want to put about 20 to 30% of coating on this thing. And we want to compare it to tablet coating. So the results on the SEM at the top, if you look at that picture, what you actually have there is that's an uncoated seed in the upper left-hand corner. And what we're really looking at is, is the, the little round particles that you see there, that's the starch that's in that endosperm of the seed. If you look on the right side for the, the SEM picture, we basically coated it. Now it's, 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 I guess it's hard to see that it's coated, but when you've looked at enough of these over a long period of time, you know, we could really see that we did a good job of coating. You know, it's a uniform coating, basically didn't change the, the size or the shape of the particle. That's what we're always looking for coating. If we look down at the bottom, and, and once again, I apologize for this, this this picture here, we basically have two uh, materials that have been fluid bed coated. One is the red line and the other is the blue line. If you can pick those out. The other three that are in there are tablet coating and the red and the blue are pretty close. And they they basically show that the particle size hasn't changed that much. The other three, the tablet coating, particularly the, 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 the purple one that, that has the, the largest average particle size, boy, there was a lot of agglomeration there. So even though we're dealing with bigger particles and particle coating by tablet coating might be the right thing to do, it didn't get us that functionality of not agglomerating the, the, the particle. So tablet coating could work, but fluid bed coating in this particular case was better. What went wrong? Nothing. The fluid bed coating was better than tablet coating, you know, it had less agglomeration. And the reality is this process is actually in production. You know, it's been been a really good process uh, for us to develop. Uh, we, we do a number of different sizes and shapes and it, you know, we can put lots of coatings on. 
So I switch gears here just a little bit. Uh, we had a customer asked us if we could make a color changing particle. And the way we make the core on this particle is a process called prilling, where we're actually going to melt a fat, atomize it, break it up, and then cool it down. And we can make particles anywhere from 10 microns to 2,000 microns. We can put all kinds of things in them. In this particular case, we only put in colors. And we can make a lot of these. And so on the right-hand side, you can see a, a picture of some of these colored particles, these beads. You can see them. And if we look on this next slide, you can actually see these beads, these red beads that we made that are realistically fairly spherical. So the, the statement of challenge that we want to do is we want to make some colored prills, make them out of fat, put a water-soluble dye in there, and then coat them with titania to, to cover this up. And then when we put them into a bakery product, when we melt it, it'll go from white to red. So we have a color change. I mean, this is this is what we're what, what we're looking at. And if you look at the the top picture of those red particles, and you look at the bottom picture where they're nicely coated, boy, I mean, we we actually did what we actually we said that we said we're going to do. But if you look closely at that picture at the bottom, you see a couple things. And, and there's a this is one of the real take homes of particle coating. You can see there's a couple broken particles in there, and you can see a little bit of red on them. And if you look closely at the white particles, you even see some little red spots on the outside. One of the challenges of, of coating materials is how perfect is it gonna be? And do you break any before you actually want to? In this case, it's pretty good, but there's a few broken ones and there's a few, looks like you know leak throughs the, the, the system. So here's the result that happened. They actually took these particles and they put them in dough. So this was a food grade product with the idea of uh, having a, a dough that was colorless. And then when you bake it, it changes color. Uh, I, I know this, this, I should have maybe had a darker background on this thing, but even on the dough particles themselves, there's a little pink in the center. But you know, when you bake them, it, it actually released a color just like we wanted to. So we, we got the effect that we were looking at. But the, the, and, and the customer was actually pleased with this. This was good enough to, to actually consider going out to market with it. But you know, from my stand, from my standpoint, it bothered me that we had just even a little bit of pink up at the top. And, and why was that? And, and I, I, I'll give you a, you know, a, a one minute uh, micro encapsulation 101. The reality is, is when we're looking at trying to coat a water soluble material, is we always have two issues that we have to think about. How perfect is that shell? And what sort of diffusivity through that shell wall will we actually have happen? And I can guarantee you that it's almost impossible to have a perfect shell, but you can get there. But I can also guarantee you that you will always have water diffusing into your capsule, your coated particle, and eventually you'll reach an osmotic pressure situation where the particles will crack. So it's very difficult when you have a water soluble material to really encapsulate this right. And I think that's exactly what we what we saw here because of, you know, is the shell perfect? And we're always gonna have water diffusing into the system. What went wrong? The, de the, the dye leaked through the dough and the solution, you know, sometimes there is no solution and maybe switch to a water and soluble dye and add another layer. So one more example. This is the one that everybody wants to do. They want to do controlled release. Uh, we had a customer asked us to do uh, coat creatine, a nicely water soluble uh, uh, amino acid uh, with uh, shellac for stomach bypass. Shellac is an enteric coating that, that is insoluble at low pH, but soluble at high pH. And you can see, we did a fluidized bed coating. We put 30% weight of shellac on this, on this system. And you know, when you look at these images, you can tell that we, we, did, we had good coating. And so we're thinking that we're in great shape on this. We looked at the creatine release here and a couple things are, are going on here. The bottom is the is the time of exposure to water and the x-axis the y-axis is the percent creatine released what you see to start with uh, when we're at low ph for the first two hours 
we're already having quite a bit of uh, leak out of these capsules that we have. You do see appropriately at each time when we switch from uh, low pH to neutral pH that there was an uptick in creatine release, uh, but not as much as I would I would like, and there was still kind of a, a slower creatine release. This is not a viable product. We did not do a good job on this one. This was done many, many years ago when we were starting out on this. And what went wrong? We, we believe the coating process was really, really good, but the drying was flawed. And if you look at the reality picture over there, this is an SEM picture that we have, you can see the cracks in the coating. This is not good. If you have a crack coating, you're probably not gonna have a good controlled release product and that's exactly what happened. At, at this point, the, the project ended for us, and but there are ways to actually make it so you minimize the cracks, but you know we didn't have the time to actually get to that stage. So what did I leave out on this talk? A lot. Uh, you know, what are the major uses of fluid beds? I, you know, I didn't talk about pharmaceutical agglomeration. There's a lot of pharmaceutical agglomeration. It, it makes it easier to, to fill uh, capsules. It makes it easier to make tablets. Food agglomeration for dis dispersibility, you know, I, I talked about it, but, you know, I need to emphasize how important uh, food agglomeration for dispersibility and dedusting. And this controlled release, I mean, this is a, one of the big issues that, that uh, big applications for fluid bed coated particles. I also left out, you know, the, the comparison between batch and continuous fluid beds. You know, I apologize for that. I mean, fluid beds will do be fluid beds. Uh, and I focused on batch because that's what I have, you know, that process dilemma again. And I didn't talk about, you know, combining fluid bed drying and uh, fluid bed processes to get better drying for cooling, for agglomeration all in one step. You know, I apologize for that, that that wasn't the, the scope of the, the talk. I wish I could talk about that, but didn't. And I wanna leave you with some thoughts. I wanna leave you with some resources. Earlier, Julie in, in her introduction, mentioned that I'm the uh, president of IFPRI. I, I will be sending you some information about IFPRI. It's an organization that, that you should belong to. These are some of the greatest people in the world. And two people that have been associated with IFPRI for years, Jim Litster and Karen Hapgood. These are, these are resources that you could call on. Please mention my name if you do uh, email them. These are some of the world's leading experts in, in fluid bed processing. Please call me if you have, have questions, but you know, Jim and Karen are are the best of the best. Also, obviously, resources. You know, the people that make equipment, Glads, Vectors, GEAs, they have a lot of lot of knowledge and are very good. I, I'll leave you with this idea for the for the future. You know, we talked about from the Derek Gildart uh, particle classification that it's hard to fluidize nanoparticles. In fact, it's typically impossible. But one person, Bob Pfeffer, who is now professor emeritus at uh, Arizona State. Uh, used three different methods and patented these methods for fluidizing nanoparticles, uh, oscillating magnetic fields, microjets, and rotating fluid beds. Please read those patents. They're incredibly good, incredibly insightful, and lots to lots to make you make you think about new ways of doing things. So, in conclusion, then, uh, you know, I think fluid bed processing incredibly versatile for drying, agglomeration, and coating. I hope I gave you some some good ideas in, in this area. I, I, I talked a little bit about process conditions and, and materials being critical, and it's incredibly in critical. And, and finally, it's almost impossible to analyze too much, particularly in that powder flow. And with that, Julie, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And you know, thank you very much for everybody for listening. Well, thank you so much. Um, I have to agree with one of the comments that came in. I thank you for, Thank you for this excellent talk. Um, she said it was excellent and a very charismatic presentation, and I definitely agree. Um, to answer other questions, um, this webinar is recorded, and a link will be automatically sent to you two hours after the webinar. So you can also visit our website um, for this, this webinar, as well as the recording of Avika's past webinar. Um, titled Mastering the Processing Method of Engineering Particles. Okay, so let me jump into the questions um, that really came in, came in doing registration. What are the pros and cons of fluid bed processing materials that are spray dried using a fluid bed to grow particle size? 
the pros and cons of it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, if you can put your fluid bed right right in uh, in line with your your uh, uh, spray dryer, so it's a basically a continuous process. It's a wonderful way of agglomeration. If you have to, you know, spray dry and then take it over to another fluid bed, you know, that's a that that's a that's a challenge. Typically, though, just remember, fluid beds are going to take that small spray dried powder and make it bigger. So, you know, spray drying you can do some agglomeration in but you know fluid beds are going to give you more uh, a, a bigger particle and, and probably more dispersibility thank you what are the key parameters and limitations of fluid bed drying the key parameters hmm. you know you know can you can you can you start moving that that uh, wet cake that you might have in there to start with and, and that's always the challenge you know you know you know, trying to push air through a wet cake can be a be a, a challenge. So, you know, how much air pressure you have, what temperature you have, you know, how long you how long you can you can do it. I, I think those are the process parameters. The advantages are, you know, it's it's a it's a it can be a nice batch process to get you that good final product. Thank you. Now the next question is: If you have a two by three millimeter pallet, would you expect more agglomerated particles using a tablet coater versus a fluid bed? You know, we use both of them. Uh, I probably wouldn't do a two by three uh, uh, fluid bed coating process. I, I, we can, we can, we've done it. I would probably go first to the tablet coater to see if I could make that work. Um, would I expect more? Agglomeration in one process or the other. I, you know, I think it's how well you've controlled your atomization parameters. If you if you have big droplets, you're just you're going to get agglomeration in both systems. Um, maybe just maybe. No, I I, I you know I, I think it's all about your atomization. I think you could probably get good good coating uh, uh, without agglomeration in both processes if you control your, your atomization process. I think that's the key. Thank you. Um, what methods have you used for characterizing coating thickness or coating strength? Wow, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Coating thickness, uh, you know, you can always do gravimetric uh, analysis and then, you know, you know, assume that you have a certain area and then you can calculate a thickness. Typically, if we're actually going to measure it, we're going to use an SEM method where we're going to coat and then break a particle and literally measure that. Uh, if you get very thin coatings uh, in the past, I, I haven't done this in a long time, but in the past, we've actually used TEM analysis. Mm. The, the, the strength of particles, you know, that's that's uh, the, the strength of the coatings. That's always the tough one. Uh, you know, people set up many different kinds of how much weight do I put on a particle, and what do I see for cracking? Um, you know, I, 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 I think that's really going to depend on on your material and and what you're going to do. And I, I apologize, I just don't know of a standard method that I would use. For, so for, I would for... say that if you, oh, sorry, thank you. So if you have more details to add, you can always send us an email at labinfo@hariba.com or avika at avika.com. Is that correct? Well. Really? Yep. Yep. That'll okay. work. Thank you. Now the next question: um, Do you use a special coating to get better dispersibility? Uh, for instance, uh, easily wetted topical coating. For, for what was the last part? I'm sorry, Julie. For instance, an easily wetted topical coating. Topical coating. Yeah. So what do you use for coating to get better dis dispersibility? So, you know, typically what people are, are trying to, to, you know, in a dispersi dispersibility issue, they're, they're typically their powders have some water solubility. So a lot of times, many times that people aren't using a coating so much as agglomerating with the material itself. So by putting water in there, we actually form liquid bridges that when they dry, they form the, the agglomerate. If I didn't have a water soluble material that I was trying to get dispersibility, I would probably use uh, some surfactant that had some binder characteristic. And so this could be things like uh, uh, modified starches. Uh, if you didn't want to use a, 
a modified starch. I mean, there's things, uh, specific fats. Uh, there's a material called aldosperse that's a soluble surfactant that's meltable. So you didn't have to dissolve it. You could actually use it as a meltable binder. Uh, pegs and pegs and uh, uh, PEG materials are, are reasonable to use for something like that. That's at least where I would start. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is more of a general question, so we can definitely add more details through the email. But um, this person is asking, what is the current view and projection about scale up and the industrial applications of this process? Well, I, it, that, that's a, that's a that's a great question. So I I showed a lot of uh, batch systems. Uh, you know, it's very easy to get a two uh, two kilogram uh, fluid bed dryer for your lab, and I've seen them go all the way up to five or six thousand kilogram batch sizes. I mean, this that's that's huge. And so people know how to scale that up from a kilogram up to you know thousands of kilograms realistically you know fluid beds if you're going to big volumes you're going to go to continuous fluid beds and in in the food industry for for really agglomerating dairy powders the fluid beds are huge they fill buildings and they're continuous so they have one part where they're putting the powder in and spraying water on getting it mixed up and then the rest of the fluid beds uh in this big building are to dry it and in those systems, the, the fluid beds, I've seen fluid beds that are 20 feet across. Uh, and you know, by the time you add it all up, they might be two or 300 feet long. So these are incredibly large fluid beds. So people know how to scale them up. I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can go a long ways with a fluid bed. Thank you. So one more question came in. Is it okay if we tackle this one and then we'll wrap it up? I wanna honor your time, Willie. Sure, no, please. Perfect. So in one of your examples, um, water is used in process, uh, water is used to process um, to create agglomeration. How is the shelf life? Hmm. So you know that was for a that was for a food product. Yeah, you, know, you know, so now we're adding water into the system, but we're also drying. So you know, we started out at low water activity, we added water, you know, we now made a, a potential bad situation and then we dried it back down. So, you know, you might've started out at a two or 3% water and you added, you know, five or 10% water and then you dried it back down to two to 3%. So shelf life probably doesn't change that much from the from the powder that, that we had. If you left the water in there and didn't dry it, well, now you've got yourself a problem and shelf life is, incredibly short for sure thank you okay i think this is it thank you so much for your amazing talk today Wally. um we will try to do another webinar specifically um on topics revolving if um in free if you're active on linkedin you can look us up by typing in avika group or particle characterization group all righty thank you so much Wally. bye now thank you.